And I think nothing uh, convinces us or, or demonstrates so much that uh, the actual failure of magic is an integral part of magic is the original disbelief of the magician. As I said earlier, he or she, they don't believe any of this stuff. They've done it a million times. They know all the tricks. They know where all the bodies are buried. Not fooling them until the magician himself gets sick, until the magician has a toothache in the middle of the night, or until the magician feels haunted or possessed or something like that. And then he's off. She's off to see another magician or another wizard, sorcerer, shaman, whatever, to cure them. Which is to say that for as much as we may or somebody may disbelieve in magic, and here's that term again, trace, there is always a residue. That's the term most actually uses is residue. There's always a residue of belief which it is impossible to overcome. And it's going to be this residue of belief, this last ember of credulity, which in moments of exigency is going to be fanned into a flame. And uh, this, quite frankly, is something that most will say is not only uh, explanatory of how very traditional societies work, but it's also uh, uh, indicative at some basic level of how modern, enlightened, scientific societies work as well. Um, so we can deny the supernatural, the ma magical, or whatever, all that we want, but the idea of enlightenment is that if we can under, if we, we can overturn all the rocks, if we can dig up all the graveyards, if we can uh, comb through all of the archives, uh, search all the catacombs, go into the Vatican Library and, and uh, discover all of the secret records. If we can scientifically or logically prove that all kinds of supernatural things uh, are shams that never existed, we will finally, at last, see the world as it actually is. There'll be nothing over which to debate. There'll be nothing we can use to fool or exploit other people. And in the state of enlightenment, of clear consciousness, devoid of superstition and uh, deceit, we'll finally see the world as it is, and then we won't have to fight anymore. Uh, but what most wants to argue in opposition to this enlightenment project of finally seeing the world with clear eyes and, uh, and, and entering into a perfect lucidity of consciousness is, no, it doesn't work that way at all. As a matter of fact, because consciousness itself is a collective uh, phenomenon driven by practical ideas and by a priori beliefs which impel us to uh, act as a community or as individuals within a community, then the moment that we get rid of every last bit of superstition, false belief, or mumbo jumbo, that's not the day we finally see the world the way that it actually is with clear consciousness. That's the day that consciousness comes to an end. Consciousness is based upon some kind of superstition, some kind of credulity, some kind of unknowability, and really consciousness is a reaction against that. The day that we get rid of that last particle of the unknown, that last particle of credulity and superstition, that's the day that all thinking ceases. So we're never going to be rid of it as long as we live. Um, even in modern scientific times, uh, scientists continue to work in this same fashion. And, and there's all kinds of books that I can invoke in a somewhat new field, though it, it, it dates back really to the uh, 
1960s. There's a famous book by uh, Thomas S. Kuhn. It's gone into countless editions and then anniversary reissuings and stuff like that. It's, it's a true modern classic. It's called the, St the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in this, he shows how science, despite uh, what certain people may have claimed about it, in uh, conventional histories is not about the slow step by step by step accumulation of greater insight and knowledge as each new thinker builds upon the previous work of the other and uh, discovery by discovery invention by invention we slowly move into a greater understanding of ourselves and of the world but rather uh, science like all other human endeavor is a thoroughly social performance a social interaction ritual which is marked by all kinds of wild oscillations from one system to another uh, outliers will come up with research or with theories which completely contradict the established theories people will fight to over to, to disprove their ideas but as they look closer and closer at these strange ideas or at this outlying evidence it begins to make more and more sense to them uh, they become convinced that the crazy guy actually knows what he's talking about and then others will begin to then investigate what's going wrong with these two they begin to see things from the new alternative perspective and at some point an entire landslide takes place and this is what uh, we'll call to use a phrase that uh, you've all heard a million times till you're sick of it but it was actually coined by thomas s kuhn we it's a paradigm shift there are those fingers okay anyway um so even science uh, goes through this kind of functionalist oscillation that Moses is talking about. Uh, there's no such thing as an independent researcher. All researchers, whether it's in the humanities or the sciences, belong to communities. And the work that they do, the discoveries that they make, or the resistance that they put up, which leads other people to either confirm that what we believe is indeed the case, more conclusively, or which cause people to abandon ship and go over to the um, new way of viewing things. Th this is all controlled on a collective basis. And that's the way it's always going to be because there's always this residue, this uh, last ember which cannot be extinguished around which all consciousness uh, emerges. So uh, this is Mose's way of viewing things. I'll, I'll say one last thing about Mose and then we'll move on to Protosky quickly and then I'm done. Um, one will say, well, you know, religion, magic, aren't they the same thing from a scientific perspective? It's all mumbo jumbo. Um, and uh, you know, again, if we were in person in the classroom, I'd try to have more of a discussion and not just talk while staring at a screen with my own face on it, though hopefully you're still watching. Um, but we are operating under these conditions, so I'll just tell you what most things. You know, what's the difference between magic and religion? Magic is the original state of human consciousness. It's a collective form of consciousness which sees the world simply doing what it does uh, for no particular reason other than that this is what the world wants to do. All things happen simultaneously. Uh, so when does religion kick in? Religion kicks in the day that we start to think that what? That there is somebody outside of nature who has a plan that they have done what? Decided that the world ought to be this way, whether it's one or many um, individuals. Uh, and having planned out what the world should look like, they are now going to bring their plan into execution after the fact. Uh, these are what we call gods. And what gods do uh, goes all the way back to what I was saying about uh, theory and praxis um, being brought together in the practical idea. When we start to come up with the theology and the idea that there's a creator, now theory and practice have been split into two different things. There's the plan and then there's the execution of the plan. Voila, we've got religion. Uh, eventually we can replace these personal forces 
with impersonal forces, and that's going to be the way that we make it to modern science. But again, modern science, because it is a human activity, is going to be a social activity, and that means it's going to be based around uh, unknowable residues of magic, and um, that whatever actions are performed, whatever discoveries are made, whatever failures uh, take place in the ongoing process of scientific research, these are always going to be collective endeavors, the individual instances of which are going to be functions of the greater collective whole. So. Uh, Again, Kuhn starts off this type of inquiry into uh, science as a collective uh, interaction ritual, and a whole host of people, which if you know this were more of a class on technology and less on magic, I could begin to evoke. But if, if you went to Car Harvard, Cambridge, Princeton, Yale, there's people all over uh, the states, over England, over the continent, and in other parts of the world who are investigating science from a historical perspective, but uh, from a social perspective. They're looking at all of the various um, practices, all of the various prejudices, all of the various material objects, which quite often, though people won't admit it, uh, are used as if they had some type of agency or power with such that uh, science does function as a kind of magic which we simply don't recognize as magic because we it's so ingrained in us from habit from years and years of training that now it, it's you know if you're a fish, it's, it's the water in which you swim. If, if you're a bird, it's the air in which you fly. You don't even think about it. You don't notice it. Same for us. Uh, if you, you know, look at scientific research and practice, it's saturated with all kinds of magic and superstition, but people don't notice it because they've been trained not to see it. A uh, couple other names that you might want to look at and that uh, maybe I'll try to invoke later in the semester. Uh, a very famous person actually come out to the U to speak is a, a French philosopher, sociologist, theorist of technology named Bruno Latour. He writes a book called Laboratory Life, and he's going to uh, look at the Salk Institute, very famous research institute, uh, with a unbiased eye and as much as possible describe the activities going on in that research center, not the way people working there would describe them, but the way they actually appear to an outside observer. And there's going to be all kinds of forces motivating uh, activity, stalling activity, directing research in this direction as opposed to that direction, and they're going to be the result of functionalism, of collective forces, and the oscillation of individual bodies from one role to another in ways that transcend the agency of the individual actor. I could talk about Stephen uh, Shapin and uh, his colleague Simon Schaffer who together write a book called Leviathan and the Air Pump. I got in a conversation at a party, if you can believe it, on that book the other night. But it's about um, the way that uh, superstitious beliefs, these traces and residues of uh, the arcane or the occult or whatever you want to call it, uh, are completely bound up with the beginning of experimental science as it's first practiced at the Royal, by the Royal Society in England in the 17th century. And, you know, th those are just two examples. I could go on and on and, and, and quote you all kinds of things that would maybe intrigue you, maybe bore you. But uh, this is the basic contention that most um, gets thinkers later in the 20th century to entertain that uh, what we think of as uh, laissez-faire intellectual activity, as a matter of fact, is the result of much larger social, intellectual, and economic forces. The, that the idea of like the independent researcher, the lone wolf, or, no. Even if these characters exist, they're still functions in a larger whole that comprehends and determines them from outside. Um, these are the basic premises of sociology, and 
once you do begin to close the textbooks, which only tell you what's right and how to achieve certain results, and start looking at actual scientific practice and reading actual memoirs, working notebooks of researchers and scientists through the lens of magic and uh, collective forces, it doesn't get more boring. It gets a lot more interesting. The great figures who you thought you knew who uh, your high school teachers indoctrinated you with their ideas and their biographies and all that, all of that starts to look incredibly diluted, in incredibly shallow and incredibly boring. So uh, I do want to look at some scientists later into the semester, but we'll look at them through this magic worldview, and I think things are going to get a lot more interesting. Okay, uh, going to end really, really quickly by getting into the Petrovsky. Now, I told you he wasn't all that interesting, and I'll be honest, I don't think he's all that interesting. Uh, a lot of students love the Petrovsky because uh, come to the end of the semester, he's the only thing that they've understood. Uh, nevertheless, I am going to strongly discourage you from writing your final paper on him because he's totally derivative. If this were the fashion world, we'd call him a knockoff. And there are websites dedicated to showing how somebody's supposed new creation was really just ripped off from BCBG or Dolce & Gabbana or whomever. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying you can't wear <laughs> knockoff clothing. You've got a right, but uh, it's nice to give credit where credit's due. Petrosky, what he's essentially done is taken the basic insight of most, and he's turned it into a cottage industry. He's kicked out book after book after book, which is just each one of them a repetition or a variation on the same theme. And in the process, he's got... <laughs> You know, he's got a career, he's got a resume that's a mile long, and he's probably bought a couple of houses on different islands. Again, it's cottage industry. Just keep cranking them out, cranking them out. Um, so why did I make you read it? And, and the answer is simple. It's because I wanted you to see that uh, the basic insights that Mos has into archaic magic, uh, traditional practices, uh, are at work in the most cutting edge research and design of our own day. So Petrosky teaches engineering at Duke. He publishes with Princeton and a bunch of other people. But all he's really going to say in his book that I made you read is no design is perfect. And it's impossible to come up with a perfect design. And even if you could come up with a perfect design, it would be an undesirable. Uh, so he's going to argue what? Uh, success through failure. We, uh, any design that you come up with, whether, and he gives lots of examples, whether it's a child's toy, whether it's a flag, whether it's a microwave oven, whether it's a cell phone, uh, all the components in it uh, and the way that they're arranged with one another are all subject to an inescapable phenomena that we call inherent vice. That means some part of the design is going to break down at one time or another. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, nothing is indestructible. So at some point, uh, the whole uh, design is going to break down because one of its parts broke down. And what we can say then is what? Well, if my telephone breaks because this diode or this motherboard or this circuit isn't working well i'll just replace that part and now i've got a perfect phone but it doesn't work that way okay you've solved this problem but the failure which is inherent or the vice which is inherent in that design isn't going to go away it's just going to migrate somewhere else well then i'll go fix that problem right and then that vice or that failure is going to do what? Migrate somewhere else. And so we learn by doing what? Following failure after failure after failure after failure in an endless progress of improving things. If you take out the failure, you're either not going to learn anything at all, or in the case of the buggy, which uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, writes about, um, you could make a buggy in which each part is as strong as every other part, and then it's not you'd have a perfect buggy, you just have what? 
a buggy which didn't break down one part at a time. So you you'd go about fixing it and improving it, but you'd have a buggy that absolutely imploded all at once. Which of the two is better? A lot harder to learn from that imploded design than a design which fails and fails and fails. And we, like uh, the magician, like the society for whom uh, the failure of magic doesn't say, well, let's just call the whole show off. No, the failure of magic leads us to do what? Perform more and more magic uh, because we're following that function of failure, even in modern design at the highest level. Uh, no individual piece of the design uh, is the failure. The failure is a function and different pieces within the mechanism are going to play that role at different times. So this is what Petrosky's all about. I don't think it's worth dwelling on him any longer. I simply wanted to say that what Mos is discovering about archaic societies, it's happening in R&D this very day, somewhere on our campus or somewhere else. So this is all I have to say about Marcel Moss and Henry Petrosky. I think I've covered quite a bit. I hope this wasn't too lengthy for you. I've tried to keep it lighthearted. I've tried to uh, supplement my presentation with uh, various images. I even gave you a little intermission. Um, so I, I hope this was not too painful for you to watch. And uh, now what I'm going to do is edit this. That'll take me a while. And as soon as I edit it, I'll post it on the blog. Um, once it's posted, I'll give you our next reading, which, as I said earlier, is by uh, an art historian named Leo Steinberg. If you go back and look at uh, when I'm talking about debate, you'll notice that uh, one of the name tags at that academic debate, the photo of which I put into the video, one of those name tags says Leo Steinberg. So I had uh, where I was headed in mind while I was making my way there. But uh, this is all you need to hear for right now. Uh, look for this video when I, well, by the time you'll be reading this, you'll already have seen the video. But uh, look for the Steinberg. Uh, I'll post that as soon as I can. Um, it's tricky in that it, it talks about a lot of painters you might not have heard of, but uh, it was not written for a particularly specialized audience. And I'll leave you to have a look at that. And you can decide for yourself whether you find it as engaging and as fascinating as I do. So that's it for now. I'm all talked out. Uh, hope you guys are having a great Friday and that you have a good weekend. And I will talk with you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.